For anyone listening who doesn't understand what is packaging and how is it different for various levels of movies, various budgets? Packaging is, is exceedingly important because it really speaks directly to the value of the product. So at Worldwide Acquisitions, for instance, when I worked there, um, we would generally, before festivals, we have relationships with sales agents who are representing certain projects out of the agencies, etc. They would come to, our, come to us with packages, you know, um, you know, and that means what actors are attached. You know, not who's reading the script, no one cares about that. Who is officially attached, right? And they would try to sell us this package and talk about how they wanted it released. So. Um, who is the director on the film? Um, how much financing is there? Are you looking for half the financing by coming to us or do you have the whole financing? Who's financing it? Um, where are you shooting this in order to get access to the tax credits in that location? So the idea of packaging is when we get involved in a project, we want to know who's attached. And the reason we want to know that is where can I sell this? Right? Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, Barbie, no-brainer, right? Um, those kind of things. When you, come, when you come with a package, they might say, look, we have all the money to make the budget, but we're looking for someone to fund the print and advertising, or as they call it, the p and um, Or we're looking for someone to, to finance the tax credit. You look at that package and go, well, Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, major A-list actors. Okay, that's good. They're attached. They're going to release it in this amount of cinemas, in these territories, in these territories. Okay, that's good. People are going to see this. Okay, look at the intellectual property. Barbie. It's pretty popular. It used to be, right? It used to be more popular back in certain decades. Those people are going to come and see the movie. Wait, it's Ryan Gosling and Margot Robbie. People who love them are going to come and see the movie. So that's the way you're thinking about a package all the time. Who's attached to it? Um, and, and what value do they bring to the project that I can now say, okay, I'm going to invest in this based on what you've already put together. And it's, it's the Ocean's Eleven me mentality that if you, if you lump a whole bunch of stars into the one movie, it makes it more attractive. I think that it didn't because of that, um, because it's not just about the actors. It's about the filmmaker and Barbie is intellectual property. It's popular intellectual property. Like The Last of Us, the TV show on HBO. Major gamers were playing that. That was a, that was a video game. It's based on a video game. So when you're packaging, you're not just looking at the actors like you know, Pedro Pascal and a lot of, those, a lot of the actors in, in that show. You're also looking at the intellectual property that it's based on because that's a market as well. So that's what we mean by packaging is what does that package look like on a saleable level? for me to invest in it. What do screenwriters need to learn about packaging? That unless they're producers, it's not their job. <laughs> um, I think one of the only true ways to protect your work is to produce it, which is so hard. It's very difficult, um, producing, um, as, in, as is screenwriting. You know? um, but I think that before you begin work on an idea, you already have in mind you should also have in mind, how is this going to be marketed and who's going to sell it? Now, I'm not saying that should be your primary reason for writing something. I write from a place of a story I want to tell, like most writers. But the idea of understanding how packaging works, this is something I teach in my workshops as part of the business part of teaching craft and business together, is that you know, okay, you, you want to write this particular screenplay with these characters and, and in this world, right? How would you market that? You know, who are you going to cast in it? For instance, if I'm writing a script with an 11-year-old girl, right? Not a lot of famous 11-year-old girls around, which means I'm not going to cast a known name in that that's going to draw people to want to see it, right? I'm going to have to cast up around that. So the people around her are going to have to be bigger names than you want which means more money, right? So being able to think from that perspective, I think, and one of the things Jason Blum did so well when he started out was minimal budgets, people work for scale, you know, even Ethan Hawke worked for scale on his movies in Sinister, right? Um, they work for scale for a piece of the back end, you can get the movie done and then churn it out. Um, and his model is, is 
was phenomenal at the time and he got people to do it. Um, and I think writers in general need to look at less locations, right, when you're starting out. Established writers who are on an assignment from a studio, that's a different world. I'm just talking about new screenwriters. Less locations, less characters. Um, avoid period, if you can. <laughs> People are going to hate me for that because um, I'm being very, you know. Avoid all of that stuff. Have a look at how much your movie's going to cost, especially in this environment. If I've got a new screenwriter who's just written a movie I know is going to cost 15, 20 million dollars to make, I just, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not. It's like taking on a movie that's, that is packaged, that a studio has said yes to, and it's a 15 million dollar budget and giving it to a first time screen, uh, director. Rarely happens because it's too risky. Um, and so that would be one of my, I know that different genres have different, different mythologies and tropes that they need to follow. Sci-fi especially and fantasy are, tend to be high budget movies and they require that. But if you're a new screenwriter and you're looking to get the attention of someone, try to scale down a little bit in the beginning and see if you can't find you know, something that is within your genre that you love but that you can do for a price. We're creating content in a different world, a much more different world. And I think there are movies that will come out of people like, you know, um, Christopher Nolan and, and Catherine Bigelow, um, who are tremendous filmmakers and storytellers. Um, there will be classics and they'll stick out from the rest. Wow. Um, but back when, you know, The Professional was made, the, there wasn't as much content to wade through. And I think so the studio system was a lot different then too in that they were, there was a lot more star-driven material. But even on, that, even on that level, it wasn't Natalie Portman at that stage that was the known actor. And I think, are they, were they classics at the time or do we perceive them as classics now? Right. You know, right. looking through the lens of what we now currently have as our environment. Um, uh, and it was, it was financed and budget, budgeted and distributed in a much more different time period than we have now. How does a screenwriter with no connections compete with writers that have whole teams in regards to packaging? Um, you can't, you're not going to get to package anything as a screenwriter. You need to focus on writing a good screenplay, no matter what level you're at. Um, and uh, the idea of trying to compete with a, a known professional screenwriter with a Rolodex of contacts is a fool's errand. You're just not going to be able to. You need to focus and control what you can. As a screenwriter, what you can control is knowing your craft, learning about the business, you know, subscribe to IMDb Pro, um, read Deadline every day, have a look at who's making what, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and just focus on your writing um, and more than one script. Don't go to a manager with just one script, right? If you're going to approach management, have two or three really polished screenplays. Because one of the first things they're gonna ask is, this is a great script, not really into this one, what else do you have? You wanna have something else and you wanna have it in good condition, not I'm writing, but oh, I have this. Um, but I think that, uh, um, the idea of, just the idea of trying to compete is going to get you in trouble. Focus on what you can, um, make sure you know your craft, stay in touch with the industry. And as I said before, when you do have those screenplays, empower people. Don't try to go after producers, managers and agents because they already have clients. They already have people that, that they have to get work for. Generally, unless you've won the nickel, <laughs> they're not gonna read your screenplay. They don't care if you're a semi-finalist in some rando kind of competition in San Antonio or whatever. No one cares about that and don't put it on your scripts because it makes you look amateurish. Just keep the formatting like it is. Um, but I will say, don't try and compete. Focus on what you can. And when you do know what your film is like and you do have a good screenplay or two, go to the coordinators and assistants in those produ production houses not agencies. Most management companies have production arms that you can do, like anonymous content. You know, and a lot of those agencies will have production people. Go to those people and empower their assistants because 
because down the track in five years time, they're going to be the next managers and agents. So you want a relationship with them now and it's easier to form because the higher up managers and agents, they just don't, don't care. And it's not that I'm being nasty, is that they don't have time to care.